right, so we are starting today with Shoshana Guggenheim Kaden. She is a social practice artist, Torah scribe, curator, and educator. Her projects engage institutional and feminist critique as a practice for imagining new possibilities. Shoshana reinvents rituals primarily, but not solely, Jewish ones, and reinserts them with new forms into familiar contexts. Shoshana is the founding artist of the Greensboro Contemporary Jewish Museum, or Hadash, and Women of the Book. Shoshana. <laughs> Thanks. All right, I'm gonna, thank you, Yona. I'm gonna share the screen here, just get the technology going. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay, great. Um, so I firstly just want to start by saying thank you to Yona and to Jada and particularly to the Jewish Art Salon. And if you're not familiar with the Jewish Art Salon, please familiarize yourselves. It's a really wonderful platform. And I particularly want to thank Yona for her flexibility in, in allowing this graduate talk to take place in this platform today and sort of uniting um, two different components. <clears throat> I also want to thank my graduate committee who is here today because this is also my graduate talk for the completion of my MFA in art and social practice at PSU. Uh, Ann Parsons is here, the director of public history at the University of North Carolina Greensboro and Rabbi Professor Elliot Ginsberg from the University of Michigan, Harold Fletcher, Ariana Jacob and Lisa Jarrett from Portland State University in the art and social practice program. And also just a thank you to all of you for being here on a Sunday morning, afternoon, evening. And also a shout out of thanks to all of you who answered that question about um, being chutzpahdik. And you'll um, see an anonymous um, gathering of those answers in some form coming up soon. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I also want to take a moment to do a land recognition to acknowledge the the people, sorry, I'm also trying to get to see myself. Which I, <laughs> um, I want to acknowledge the original people of the land that I'm sitting on right now, that we call Portland, Oregon and Multnomah County, and the people of the traditional lands of Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Cowlitz, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many, many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. Um, just a few words on naming. <clears throat> there will be a lot of naming today, terms, people's strategies. It's okay if it's unfamiliar. You can just relax. I invite you to relax into not knowing and to explore that um, possible discomfort of a non-dominant cultural experience in the foreground while also staying present and just sitting in curiosity. So, <clears throat> So I'm Shoshana, Bat Nadia, Bat Nadia Levana, Bat Panina, Bat Estel, Bat Anna. Oops, sorry. And I'm also an Ivri. Uh, I come from an ancestral lineage of Hebrews. And Ivri in biblical Hebrew means a descendant of the Hebrew or Israelite tribe. And the feminine form, and in modern Hebrew, it's Ivrit. Is so there's a way that the feminine form of Ivri is Ivri A, and the language itself, the last word you see here is Ivri, and you can see that the, the language and the person are embedded one in the other. But there is also another meaning of Ivri A, and that is <clears throat> boundary crosser. And I thank um, Rabbi Gershon Winkler for, for, for introducing me, me to this idea. And we might also call that chutzpah. So what is chutzpah? Since after all this talk is called chutzpah as art practice. <clears throat> so possible definitions that I just want to lean into these suggested definitions. <clears throat> Audacity, the daring to break from tradition while deeply honoring tradition and taking bold risks. Gal to suggest something different within a long-standing tradition or counter to the cultural norms, and nerve, requiring 
courage, and sense of purpose. So in my art practice, this looks like disrupting and dismantling normalized systems of male privilege and power, often in a Jewish context, or reclaiming my position in my inherited ancestral tradition by shaping and reshaping ancestral memory and um, inserting a new narrative. And that takes many different forms. <clears throat> So um, I've been inspired and informed by those who come before me and uh, by my contemporaries. And I want to introduce who I believe to be the first chutzpanit and who came quite early in the Jewish tradition. Some of you might recognize um, who this is representing. And this person also happened to be the first example of erasure and demonization of a woman in the Hebrew Bible. <clears throat> The most ancient biblical account of the creation relates that God created the first man and the first woman from the earth at the same time. Jewish legends tell us that this woman was Lilith, and that is who you're seeing representations of here. Lilith, we learn, felt herself to be Adam's equal, but Adam and God, it turns out, refused to accept her equality. Lilith refused male dominance and proved it by being on top during intercourse. She was banished from the Garden of Eden and was taken in by Satan El to be one of his many wives. This is one legend among many, many legends. <clears throat> and I also want to recognize and remember another amazing chutzpanit. Um, from among contemporary artists, and that is Helene Elon, Zichonad of may her memory be a blessing. She was a Jewish feminist and interdisciplinary artist who recently died of COVID complications just in April and was beloved by many in the art world and by this Jewish art salon. In her series, The Liberation of God as part of the God Project is of particular interest to my own wrestling with Jewish text and my own work. And she writes, I highlight over words of vengeance, deception, cruelty, and misogyny, words attributed to God. I do not change the text, but merely look at this dilemma. And her work, I, my work is, I feel, is constantly in a, in a dialogue with Helene's. I continually go back to her early work and her, the work she was doing all the way up until she passed. And I also want to bring into this space the memory of Bonna Haberman Browns, who was a friend, feminist, theologian, activist, Torah scholar, and author. And she really modeled for me um, building a home within the text. And when I went to her, when I was just setting out to become a Torah scribe and starting my first Torah scroll, when I sat with her to, to talk about the impact of, of women scribing, she said that we as women are participating in a text that is not other, it's a refuge, a, a homecoming. And her question was, how do we come home to the text? And that really um, is a lot of the work that I'm doing. <clears throat> so uh, this is what coming home has looked like for me. Sorry, I'm dropping papers to the side here. <laughs> Um, for me, it was moving to Israel and literally embodying Judaism in my ancestral homeland. <clears throat> and, but it also took shape um, in object making and meaning making. So inserting meaning in places where meaning had been lost in my family lineage and specifically in ritual objects, pushing boundaries of ritual form. And then uh, I started leaning into scribing, which became, which became my coming home to the text in, in a language that was familiar to me, and that was the language of making. And it was really, for me, an ancestral memory gathering. Um, I was writing the spiritual map of the Jewish people alongside my own personal spiritual map. Um, it's also important to note that when I set out to study, this was a 3,000 plus year old history that had not yet made a place for women at the scribing table. And it took me eight years to find a teacher who would agree to teach me. And there were some women who were learning quietly, but we hadn't quite yet found each other in 2000 when I started learning in Jerusalem, but we were quickly reaching a tipping point where there would be more women. 
And I want to just take a moment here to insert some information about social practice because my relationship to scribing was not and still is really not a conventional one. Um, I found that I began to contextualize my practice as a scribe within a social practice or conceptual art form. Um, and so what social practice, just to say a few words about social practice, it really breaks down the, the model of the studio, the gallery, and the audience, and it centers an engaged social interaction that draws from conceptual art practice uh, for all for the formation of the work. So my work um, <clears throat> often has an object at its center, but many social practice artists work is not oriented towards objects at all. And some strategies of social practice that appear in my work that I'll talk about as we go include insertion, replacement, reframing, claiming, and no need to go into those, to those terms. So this is actually um, me in the early, early days of beginning to scry, but I just want to set a larger context for this um, about really I was claiming this position in a male unbroken lineage of sacred or indigenous craft of the Jewish people. And I wanted to just thank Sarah Seastrom, who's a Native American artist in the Portland area for really helping me to name this work as indigenous craft. That was a really important homecoming for me. And you can see that like, physically there's this choreography of replacement. Really, I'm just, I'm replacing this male body that many people associate with the scribe. And so it's really the same choreography in a female body. And recently I've just been exploring this choreography as naming it as durational performance and borrowing from the language of the gender theorist, Judith Butler, and what she calls performing gender. And I know that it's stretching her ideas of performing gender, where she's really talking about um, socially constructed commonplace speech acts and movements and nonverbal communications that are performative. Um, and so I think about this as reinserting the erased female body into the arc of gender Jewish tradition and practice and in writing myself and all women into the narrative of participation and history, simply by scribing as a gendered act of performance or choreography. <clears throat> The other thing about the scribing and the way I've been looking at it is that is, is finding it in a contemporary art context. So here you see scribe Julie Seltzer um, in this parallel frame of the hunched over <laughs> male scribe. Um, but she, but the situation here is important because she was actually invited by the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco to scribe on site in the museum. And so it, suddenly scribing was put into a contemporary art context and there was a dialogue to be had. <clears throat> and that was, for me, I continued, and this is Julie and myself and our teacher, Dove Lehman in Jerusalem during the Jerusalem Biennale. And I invited the three of us to come to the public and have an open dialogue about the, the meaning, the history, the implications of women scribing. So it was really exploring this notion of contemporary cultural production of the sacred. And this is something that I continue to look at in my work. <clears throat> okay, so that is setting a little background. So the scribing led me to some place I could have never imagined if you had asked me when I set out um, learning in 2000. It led me to this place where I am now working on a project called Or Hadash. And what Or Hadash does is it interrupts the animal skin supply chain sourced from the industrial animal complex and used for the making of parchment and it's replacing it with skin sourced from animals raised with high animal welfare practices. Or Hadash also educates the public about the craft, the animal industry, and the people engaged in parchment making. And this is all achieved through parchment production, uh, film workshops, a publication, public dialogue, and a working business model that prioritizes relationships animal welfare, inquiry, and collaboration. Um, and I'll add that it is a work in progress. 
It's operating on every level in very slow time. And I actually value the slowness. It's working in, um, working in an inter interdependent system that values animals, both animals and humans, and it, re it centers the regeneration of soil and people and culture. And just a note on the name, um, Or Hadash is a play on the word, the, um, a new light, which would be spelled with a, a different letter. Um, and I replaced the letter and created from light skin. So it's new skin, um, which is a fun, for me, a really fun play with the words. So just to give a little, uh, just to set a little context and meaning for this and to understand the scale, a Torah scroll is um, written on about the, on the skins of about 60 different uh, animals and about 99% of these skins used for writing sacred Hebrew texts are sourced from the industrial animal complex in the United States and Argentina, some from New Zealand, but we're facing less of this issue with the, with the skin source there. And um, the family that I've been working with, the, the Clothbot family who makes parchment and sells parchment, they process about 2,000 skins a month, just to get it, just to understand that, okay? Um, so the questions that are driving this project for me are, what makes an object sacred? When or what is the moment that an object transitions from mundane to sacred? What is the human's capacity and responsibility in that moment? And can an object be deemed sacred just because the appropriate blessings or invocations have been stated? Is it enough? Okay, so a little bit more background on the process to understand why it's going, where it is, and where it's going. So um, <clears throat> in the making of parchment skin, has to be a kosher animal and most commonly, most commonly it's a um, cow. It can be a sheep or goat or for some it can be deer. The animal doesn't need to be killed through a shpita, through a kosher slaughter. And what we are using are the skins of the embryos, which you can see um, an embryo inside the, this cow. <clears throat> The, cow, the skins are coming from retired dairy cows and who are living and being raised in pretty terrible conditions that many of us know about. It's definitely what we would call the animal industry complex and it's really working outside of a normal animal life cycle. Um, so our life cycles are sped up, exploited, maximized. <clears throat> and this is a photograph of what we call slunk. It's dealing with the fetal, we're dealing with fetal cow skin. And so um, these calves are taken from the retired pregnant dairy cows at slaughter. They're not slaughtered for the calves, it's byproduct, which is also important to understand. I do want to um, recognize factory workers who are embedded in this process and who especially right now have been hit really hard by this pandemic. And these workers alongside the animals, I feel are victims of this whole systemic oppression, which is exploitative to the land and to the animals and to the people. It's propelled by capitalism where the rate of production and output is valued more than the animals and the people. And it's complicated and I can't go into the whole thing today, but I wanna give you a little, a little background. So just to understand those skins get put aside and frozen. There are contracts um, that between the parchment makers and the factories, they get sent over in frozen containers to Israel. There's almost no parchment at all for Hebrew scribes being made in the States. If it is, it's just people on the side. The industry is in Israel. And then they take out the skins, they process them. And you can see, again, the emphasis of um, uh, a quantity, so much quantity of skins. And this short sort of walks you through the process just to get an idea of what's happening. It's very, it's completely male. Um, and I'll show you how that has changed a little bit. And then it comes to the storefront. And again, you can see lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of parchment. And I, and this is, um, 
one of the members of the Klossbach family. And I want to emphasize that, you know, that the, the family is really, there's, this is not to blame or shame the family in any way because they're just a part of the system and they have been absolutely extraordinary in their um, openness to women scribes and to giving us, giving me access to the facility. And it's sort of a don't ask, don't tell situation. They know what we're doing, but they've never asked. We never talk about it. They just allow us to buy parchment and that is unique in Israel. <clears throat> so what keeps me up at night, however, is this question, how does the Jewish community reconcile the inhumane treatment of animals upon whose backs we are literally writing and forming our most sacred Jewish objects with the place these objects hold in our ritual lives? And I think about um, the uh, Peter Korn in his book, Why We Make Things and Why It Matters. And he states that objects are a material manifestation of the collective consciousness of its time and place channeled through the individuals who commissioned and made it. Which leads me to ask, how do we together shift our collective consciousness? And for me, it's led to this chutzpah vision to basically upend the entire industry with a new model of parchment skin sourcing. And so I've been working, I started out by working with um, a ritual slaughterer, Shochet, in the West Bank. And um, working with him, he would provide skins for me from local farmers, people that he was, he was working with, backyard animals. And so what fades to the back, then, then the skins get taken to the same factory and get made in the same way. So all of the industry fades to the back, but the process is the same everywhere. And the result of that has been, um, Julie Seltzer wrote a Megillat Estelle on this Orchadash skin. And then, you know, we, it's, we have just a, just a little bit because we're getting started and some, in a, in a Torah panel, a, a um, blank panel has been sewn into a Torah scroll here in Portland. And I just want to um, point out that on this notion of women, that there is a rabbi, rabbi and scribe, Linda Motzkin in upstate New York, has been making parchment on deer skin and writing a Torah scroll for her community over many, many years. And this was a gathering of Jewish women scribes um, who assisted her in making the parchment. So where I've shifted in this since we've been in the States is really um, a few things have shifted for me. The recognition that there's a really, really large footprint of skins um, being shipped back and forth. It's really difficult because the quantity is so large to control, um, to have quality control. And that has a lot to do with the material waste. Like if it doesn't work, meh, it's okay because there's always an another one. There's always another skin. So the quality um, on this particular sheep and goat skin hasn't been at, the, at a quality high enough to really write with ease. And also, you know, understandably so, a lack of investment from the, the cloth makers, the parchment makers in Israel. And, um, and so, <clears throat> so I've been having this material conversation and this um, sending back and forth of parchment and samples of parchment with some folks and some parchment makers in upstate New York. And we are working out a partnership with these two women who from Central Grazing Company who raise sheep um, at very high animal welfare and sourcing their skins from them and having the parchment made uh, in upstate New York with the folks there. <laughs> and the important thing to note is that um, this whole process is then being created into a publication. I've been working with this artist, Matt Tonti here, who you actually only see the back of his head. Um, and we've been working to create a publication and graphic narrative that's really telling the story in a, in a different way so that people can, can really understand um, how this works and what is happening. And this will accompany the Or Hadash that goes out to scribes to communities or several communities who are interested in having a Torah scroll written on this parchment. And so we are working towards the publication of that and got support from the Regional Arts Council here in Portland. And the, the sales of the, or this will accompany the sales of Or Hadash and it'll be used, like I said, to tell the story. 
I'm going to breathe and take a pause here. <laughs> Yona, this is where we were going to open up for questions, if that still makes sense. Oh, totally. Um, so everybody, um, you may notice that um, in the participant box, if you, if you click on that at the bottom of your screen, there is the possibility for you to raise your hand. And I will call on people who raise their hands to either you know, make a statement or preferably ask a question to Shoshana. Um, Fred Andelman, I think it is. Yeah, please unmute yourself and it's okay. all yours. Uh, would you please uh, repeat, I, I, I must have missed it, uh, why um, calf skin from a cow is, um, I'll call it sinful or whatever um, adjective, but a calf skin from a deer or um, sheep calf is okay. Yeah, I, that probably, uh, that was my fault because I think I wasn't clear about that. So the industry basically is supporting the demand for fetal calf skin because it is the most supple. It's the easiest skin to write on. Um, it's easy to acquire and it um, uses some of the waste from, from the industry. But because it's embedded in this industry, I'm concerned about those, those implications on many different levels, what that means for us. And so the skins that of the animals that I'm working with are not fetal skins. They're, they're grown animals. Oh, okay. So the, uh, the sheep and the deer are not... Um, okay, yeah. so th they are adult skins. They're adult or they're... they're they're all different ages. I'm not personally working with deer skin. That's that's okay. what Linda is is doing. Um, but these are sheep. It has been sheep and goat, and will primarily be sheep. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, Shoshana, I just wanted to say that I was so delighted that you've been so influenced by um, Helene Ailan. She was a founding member of the Jewish Art Salon, mm -hmm. and. Um, so we were at the same, the Jewish Art Forum had a, a big exhibition at the Biennale at the same time that you presented your big project, Women of the Book, there. But I didn't realize at the time that Helene was so important to you. So it's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, next question is by Leora Troper. Hi, Leora. Hi, Shoshana. <laughs> um, so, green chair, please. Uh, oh. People are asking to turn off screen share. Uh, oh, so. okay. Uh, yeah, and um, that's sorry. not my <laughs> Better? <laughs> um, so, so my question is, uh, looking at the huge quantity of skins, is there really such a demand? I mean, why are they producing so many? You know, um, it's a little baffling to me too, and I don't have a, a good answer for that question. There's just, um, there's constantly mezuzot and tefillin. Like my teacher has actually never written a Torah scroll. So really Torah scrolls are not the primary market. It's a huge, huge amount. And people, some artists use them. I've used it in art projects. Um, I won't use that skin anymore, but um, I can't, I cannot, it's, baffling to me yeah okay because i mean mrs and fillin scroll they're not so big <laughs> <laughs> i know i know <laughs> interesting um yeah. the next question is by richard mcbee but before you talk richard uh, several participants have left questions in the chat box um but really to get them answered you need to just raise your hand in the participant box thank you Okay, Richard, go ahead. Unmute yourself. So, Shoshana, thank you so much. Um, Hi, Richard. I, uh, I learned a lot in your presentation, but I kind of had a question in the middle of it, and I guess really it's been on the whole thing. Um, I am unclear how scribing uh, for anyone, uh, no gen gender having nothing to do with it, scribing is an art practice. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it isn't. You spoke earlier about kind of, you, you went into a lot of uh, relationships with various aspects of conceptual art and how, you know, you don't necessarily need an object and all of that. I just don't quite see, um, I mean, I've spent my entire life 
making what I call art. Um, only, and it's very, very traditional. It's mostly paintings and sometimes photography and, and et, et cetera. Um, and I make a distinction between what I do and what other people do with great, great distinction, but making crafts and making an object to be used. And that I, I, I deeply believe there is a distinction between those two things. Do you believe that's a distinction? Could you explain a little bit more and help me out here? Yeah, I, I'm gonna, um, I also just wanna note, I wanna take this as the last question and, and continue after this. Um, I know there are lots of other questions, but I wanna have time. Um, it's a, that's a very, very long answer, Richard, <laughs> for that. And it's a long dialogue that's been going on. I think for me specifically thinking about, and I will only speak to scribing um, in my personal relationship, because this is me um, exploring it in conceptual art terms. Um, it's, it's really about understanding it in a, in a performative way and really dealing with this gender because it has so much meaning attached to it still today over time, there will be less and less meaning attached to it as regards the gender, I hope. Um, but also I think this important piece that I, that I really wanted to touch on is that is the, the picking it up by the contemporary art world. So that where the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco situated scribing inside the museum, I think that was a really, really important step towards separating it from how you might think about it as craft to something that really um, can, can exist inside a contemporary art context. And that for me, it was pushed further in some other events that happened in Jerusalem, but also in that moment of being in the art gallery where Women of the Book was um, exhibited at the Jerusalem Biennale and having this conversation in a contemporary art context with Julie and Dove and myself. <laughs> and, and, and we can talk more about that. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna continue if that's okay. Yo, and I can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, those of you who raised your hands, there will be a lot more time afterwards to ask Shoshana questions. So uh, just hang in there. After the next session, we'll open it up for more questions and there'll be more time. Thank yeah, you. I just want to honor people's time frames who want to go and also want to get through all of this. And there's, there's two more projects that I want to talk about, including my graduate project at the end. So I'm gonna reshare here. Okay, we just did questions. <laughs> okay, so I, um, I wanna introduce a project that I started in 2018 and have been collaborating on with artist and designer Jordan Rosenblum. It's called Citizen 100, and it is a public exploration of citizenship and the nature of belonging in the United States. Um, <clears throat> it is specifically an institutional critique of the United States government's approach toward shaping US citizens and creating or not a sense of belonging. And it uses the naturalization exam as a starting point while publicly and collectively rewriting the exam based on how the public collaborators respond to this prompt of what questions should US citizenship applicants be asked. So like I said, it began in 2018 and, and I, I do want to recognize the sensitivity of this subject relevant to today's political arena. Um, it's a very hot topic and it's very complex. Um, and this very important dialogue that we're having on, or, beginning, I hope, on systemic racism in the United States that's very long overdue. So I want to also recognize the, the privileged position of citizenship security and whiteness, or I would say in my case as a Jew, middle race, um, that, that both Jordan and I bring to the rooms where we meet with our collaborators. People's lives and family and unity really depend on becoming a citizen and that is not overlooked in this project. And we talk about it with all of the groups. So it's a really important um, thing that is a topic of dialogue that is in the room with us. And we've had people of all different citizenship statuses in, in the room having this conversation together. 
Um, I just want to recognize the artist Anna Callahan. I wanted to reference her work, the Danville Community Encyclopedia here, just as informative research to this process. She created an encyclopedia that contained knowledge of the citizens in Danville, Illinois. And in these, um, this knowledge was recorded in interviews with them in the library in 2003. And what it's really getting at and asking is what is knowledge? Who owns public knowledge? And who has the agency to create something like an encyclopedia, this book of, of knowledge? And these are similar themes that we find ourselves exploring in this project. So I came across um, this really fascinating object after already really starting to dive into trying to understand what this naturalization process is. And this is a hundred flashcard study set with the hundred questions that are on the naturalization exam, which some of you may have taken. Um, and this is made and distributed by the USCIS. <clears throat> and this is the 2018 set. So just to get a sense of what they look like, um, this, the at the top you see the front of the card, and this is sort of the object around which this is revolving. Um, you see the, the question on the front of the card with the Statue of Liberty logo on each one of them, and then the, quest, the answer on the back and an image that's attached to that. And we're asking how do these questions and and these cards construct meaning of citizenship and assign value um, through both the questions and the images. In this case, with the cards, the images that are attached, because on the exam, it's just the questions. But I'm really interested in this, this larger package here. Um, you might notice that, and just looking at these very briefly, that it is very militaristic, it's very male, and it's very white, and that a lot of the questions and the images lack sort of any emotional personal or critical thinking. So some of the guiding questions on this project um, that are really leading us as we go into different spaces and that have sort of been shaped as um, we've worked with these different collaborators who are bringing us questions is what defines us as citizens or how do we perform citizen? Um, how is knowing or not knowing this body of knowledge shaped your sense of citizenship? Are you or your people's history reflected in these questions or how and many, many other guiding questions. Um, I do want to add for me that there is personal meaning in this, finding myself in these questions, both as a new immigrant to Israel where I lived for 20 years and then my return to the United States, sort of finding a sense of belonging in the United States as a Jew, both um, historically and in a contemporary manner. And also the struggle that I had as an immigrant in Israel and everything that that raises. So there's a lot of personal meaning in this project for me. Um, so I approached uh, Gerald Scrutchens, who at the time was a social studies and civics teacher and historian at the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School in Portland, Oregon, which mostly serves a young people of color. He was super excited about bringing this to his classroom. They had just studied civics and um, history. And so we basically brought this whole process in and we brought all of the questions from the exam to the students. We did the exam together, we deconstructed the exam and we began inserting new questions that were really relevant to the students. And then they started this process of researching the questions. And so for example, one student, and they would come up with several questions asked, is it a right to have health insurance in the United States? Or who was the first black president? So what really emerges is, the is a new sort of relevancy. <clears throat> we brought the students then to City Hall in Portland as part of Assembly, which is a co-authored social practice conference through um, the art and social practice program at PSU. And and they then brought the process that we had done in the classroom to the public in City Hall at this gathering. And you can see that students and other folks, the public engaged in these questions in the answering. And then we created this sort of wall, generated this wall of new, new questions. And we just continue to, to build on them and working with lots of different groups throughout Portland. Um, I did work with a group in North Carolina and 
both marginalized and non-marginalized groups. Um, again, it's not, a, it's not a project about immigration, it's a project about belonging and citizenship and knowledge. It's really a disruption of the gatekeepers of knowledge and really giving cultural agency to the people. And so in these dialogues and all these different rooms, there are different um, categories, new categories of the exam that emerge. You can see on the right hand side, some of the categories that already exist on the exam and the new categories that um, started emerging and that we've created in this project. So things like um, American myth, that's very intriguing to me, and uh, race and racism, equity and social justice, and many more categories. Questions like, do you know where to access public services? What native tribe lived on, what native, I can't see behind here. Name what native tribe the land you live on truly belongs to. And then the, um, the next part of this is then matching these, taking all these questions that people have asked, continuing to go out to groups and then working with the complication of bringing images to that to really model this. I was really, really interested in this replacement model of taking the cards as they are and replacing it with something very different, but very similar in, um, in visually. And so we, uh, this is in our living room, working with uh, a bunch of folks who are really taking questions people had generated and doing image research. And the result of that is these cards. Um, this is a mock-up of the, of the cards. It will be a finished object as a set of the 100 cards. It will be distributed to the sites where we've worked and then presented to the USCIS. Um, the cards will reside in centers of learning and culture, schools, community centers, libraries, and it can also be offered as a teaching module for disrupting the normative history that's, that's often taught and also will allow the public to expand the collection of questions by creating a process by which they can add to the questions and create new ones. And so here's another example. You can see just a, 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 new, a new sort of relevancy in the, in the questions that have been generated. Okay, <laughs> I'm time check here. Great, okay. Um, so jumping to the, my most recent project um, started with a phone call from Dr. Ellen Haskell, who is the head of Jewish studies at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. She was uh, reaching out to inquire about my coming to be an artist in residence at the university um, and to come and do a couple workshops and come home. And I suggested to her, I said, you know, what if we could just like break this mold and do a big project and, um, and really make it something that the whole community could, could get behind. And so, um, and the other thing I want to say is that when she had reached out to me, um, it was a very exciting thing for me. It made me say yes right away. I didn't care how I was going to show up. I just wanted to show up because I had lived in Charlotte, North Carolina through my junior high and uh, high school years, and my whole family of origin still lives there, but I lived a very divided life between school and Judaism. I was, I was othered as Jewish at school, and then I had my Jewish friends from youth group, but those places never, never intersected. And so this for me was an opportunity to come to North Carolina on my own terms as a Jew and as an artist. And that is why I said yes <laughs> right away. Um, and so, so I did a site visit in September um, after Ellen had, had gotten on board and said, okay, yeah, like let's do a big project, come visit, let's figure out what it's gonna be and, and we'll make it happen. So I did the site visit. I was walking from in September and I was walking from the place where I was staying to the university on the first day. I was going to teach some classes um, in the Jewish studies department and in the art department because we were collaborating with both. And I saw the sign that said, thank you, Jesus, in the yard. And I thought, what would it, what, what would it look, how, could, is it possible that someone could put a sign in their front yard that said, thank you, Allah, 
or thank you Adonai and just really have that exist there. I would personally be too afraid to do that. And um, I've never seen anything like that. And this really reminded me of the culture in which I had grown up and it, it, drove, it really drove home that narrative. And, um, and it reminded me of these boundary crossing conversations that I wanted to bring to the students and the Jewish community, which included really looking at anti-Jewish oppression. So my challenge was how to create a project, a, a Jewish project in a Christian dominant Southern culture that could engage the primarily Christian university students I would be working with in the Jewish studies department and in the art school. Um, and also collaborating with and answering a real hunger in the larger Jewish Greensboro community, which at the time had, was reeling from a recent loss of the singular pluralistic Jewish boarding school, which was in Greensboro for 18 years. It had just um, very, very quickly closed its doors and the community was really mourning and, and wrestling with that, with that loss. Um, and so when um, Ellen asked me, I said to her, um, here's what I've been thinking about. And um, I had read an article by this Jewish art critic, Edward Rothstein. And he basically, at the end of the article, basically the way I saw it, put out a challenge to create a Jewish museum. So I was just like, let's create a contemporary Jewish museum in Greensboro. And Ellen was said, seriously? <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. And it was, and she said, okay, great. And it was really the first yes of what I would then call a yes project. Every, everything after that was just yes, yes, yes. How can I help? What can I do? Yes, let's do this. Yes, let's do that. Everything I suggested, people just said yes. It was amazing. Um, and I want to just add that I really took uh, inspiration for this idea of creating a museum, not only from Edward Rothstein's challenge, but also from some familiarity with other people who had done this model, like the King School um, Museum of Contemporary Art in Portland, and also um, Libby Warbell's project, the Portland Museum of Modern Art, which was set in the stairwell and basement of an independent uh, record store in North Portland and it really functioned like a museum for the five years it was running and with unknown and well-known artists and it was established and run by the artist herself. And I was also in thinking about how we would create some kind of collection, I was introduced to and really inspired by the work of Cesare Pietro Iusti who is a conceptual artist and takes sort of a sociologist and philosopher's approach to art making. And he was, he had did a project where he invited individuals to bring something to the gallery that they believed was definitely not art. Um, and the work really focused on this paradox of an art project that features explicitly non art objects shown in an art context, which I think um, maybe even reckons back to the, the question that you were asking, Richard, in some, in some way. Um, and so, in creating a contemporary Jewish museum in North Carolina, there were lots of questions on the table. Um, what can serve as an emerging model? Who's going to be represented? What's it going to look like? And what's it going to offer? And do we have the cultural agency to do this? And the answer, my answer always is, yes, we do. You do. And it was really important that they, they create this museum. And so it, we took on um, the uh, framework of a museum. So it was an art museum. There was an inaugural exhibition called 36 plus 2, which you'll see a bookstore, a catalog, a living archive, public events, and a website, and some really generous funding. Um, and that was so lovely. And so the Greensboro Contemporary Jewish Museum ended up being um, created from the participation of 150 people from the UNCG student body, staff, faculty, and the greater Greensboro community. It began in September with that first site visit and we opened in February um, with three days of events. And it was really sort of decentralizing the museum and dispersing this cultural agency to the people. Um, 
And that was because they were the folks who were creating the museum through their own personal collections of objects. And another strategy that we used was marking the site of the museum itself was dispersed because each home where the objects resided was a home of the museum because that's where the collection lived when it wasn't in the gallery for those three weeks. So that in theory, one could visit the museum after the gallery closed by visiting each home or work site or whatever the site was. Um, and really sort of expanding on this public idea of what a museum is. So the, the guiding question was to please share a personal object that is imbued with significance to you as a Jew. And I deliberately did not use the word sacred. It was really hard to formulate this question. It had to be the right question. And I deliberately didn't use the word sacred because I was looking for non-universally identifiable Jewish objects, objects that were deemed Jewishly sacred by the owner that was re and revealing information about their personal Jewish identity through their own relationship with the object. So um, could be anything. And of course, for many people, it was hard to make that separation, understandably. And so there's a combination of these universally identifiable objects and, and new ones. And the objects and their stories tell a contemporary narrative of Jewish life in Greensboro. And participation required that you live in Greensboro and you identify as Jewish. We didn't card people, we just said, we just asked them if they identified as Jewish or they came for, a lot of people just came forward. And so the students in both the art school and the Jewish studies um, classes that I was working with, they went out into the community and um, asked this question to people and interviewed them and recorded those interviews, which I, they did, they did some writing and I took those and wrote them into essays. And then I also came back to Portland and continued to interview people by Skype. And so these are some of the objects. Um, you'll also notice that there's a, the, the, collaborate, the collaborators who I call anybody who participated, but particularly the people who were offering their objects from their own collections, um, range from four to 85. And so um, this was Ezra's piece. It was a tiger's eye rock that he had gotten from his grandmother who had recently died <clears throat> and was very, very meaningful to him. Um, Rebecca, who shared a Tupperware container that had had food in it that was delivered to her when she was battling cancer. She's a rabbi in the community and an educator. An eight-year-old Sophia, or 10-year-old Sophia and Elena, her sister, um, Sophia in particular, had designed this bench, which you see the back of, for the Jewish day school where she went and wanted it to be a place where people could congregate. And we took the bench and brought it into if they were really struggling emotionally, it was a place where they could go so people knew that they were having a hard time and could come talk to them. And we took the bench and brought it into the gallery. Um, Ellis's grandfather's um, pillows that he had needle pointed. Um, and then this is just something I wanna share, an audio recording that I had done on Skype with Sam Cohn. Um, and he's reading from an ethical will that had been in his family for 150 years, his great, I believe it's his great, great grandfather. I'm sorry, Sam, if I don't remember that correctly. Um, and this is him sharing a small portion of that. You may shed tears because you are leaving your parents' house, your father, brother, and sisters, relatives, friends, and your native land, but dry your tears because you may have the sweet hope of finding a second home abroad and a new country where you will not be deprived of all political and civil rights and where the Jew is not excluded from the society of all other men and subject to the severest restriction. But you will find a real homeland where you as a human being may claim all human rights and human dignity. Be careful. So we had that recording um, playing um, for people to listen to the full reading of the, of the ethical will in the gallery. So a lot of things happened, were built and constructed and, and just emerged around this project. Um, the museum studies class that was run at the time by Jennifer Reese, um, she brought her students in, in that were in a um, collections class and we 
it was basically a living laboratory for them to practice everything that were, they were learning about collections and to use the, the museum as a way to write these amazing condition reports for all the objects as they came in and as they left. And so this is the installed in uh, the, the museum was installed and the exhibition 36 plus two was installed in the Greensboro project space gallery. And I worked very closely with the artist uh, Adam Carlin, who's the director of GPS, who's a dear friend and colleague. And this is beautifully curated space that he and Billy Dees uh, worked on and created together. And we really were very carefully thinking about how we could bring different dimensions to the representation of the of the collection. And then we were all ready to open and it snowed the only day that it snowed all year in Greensboro and we had to come all the way from Portland to Greensboro, North Carolina to have our to have our kids have a snow day. So we rescheduled the opening and um, and went on with all of our events and event and then had our opening on Sunday and you can just see. It was super, super beautiful, well attended. It was really amazing to have found a klezmer band in Greensboro. Part of all of this that was so important was really, really digging into the community and pulling people out of the community who could contribute to Jewish culture there. Um, this is someone listening to the ethical will <clears throat> using the bench, which was so great. And then we created a catalog um, and in the catalog, we had the stories as they had been rewritten and um, or summarized um, and put into essay form. And this is, um, you know, from inside the from inside the catalog. And then the other thing that we did is that um, the Greensboro Project Space has an art truck that tra that um, can be utilized. So we integrated it into the Greensboro Contemporary Jewish Museum and used it as a way to collect more stories and more objects during the duration of the of the exhibition. So on the opening night, we invited people to bring objects, and there was a space there. The truck was parked outside, and they could come and and Stacy Krim from the University Archives of at Greensboro, she interviewed people all throughout the night. And then during the three weeks that the show was up, she traveled with the art truck to different designated locations and more and more people brought their objects. She recorded them and then they were dropped. You can see on the bottom left there, they were dropped into a, a, a screen um, and a video that was running throughout um, in the gallery and also dropped into an online archive that anyone can access. That was a really, um, really special way. And again, this, this way of allowing the project to continue and for more people to contribute. Um, and so the bookstore was a collaboration with Scuppernong Independent Bookstore in downtown Greensboro, right near the gallery. And it would house the Greensboro Contemporary Jewish Museum, which was created through, um, I reached out to two uh, Jewish North Carolinian authors who curated a collection of, of North Carolinian Jewish titles for the for the um, the Greensboro Contemporary Jewish Museum bookstore in Scuppernong. So beautifully, beautifully done, very, very thoughtful. And that was with Jessica Jacobs and Richard Chess from Asheville, North Carolina, who did that curatorial work and then came and participated in a lot of the um, programming. Um, a quick thing, and I'm getting close to the end for those of you who might be concerned. <laughs> a quick thing is that, and this is really important, there is a, um, this is the interior of Elsewhere, and it was offered as an object. Um, this is the, it's the interior of a building, of a, of a site called Elsewhere, and it was offered as an object from one of the collaborators. Um, it's an important, has important significance to me in this project. It was a former thrift store in downtown Greensboro that was owned and operated by a Jewish woman. It had been shut for many, many years with all the objects in place and then reopened by the grandson of the proprietor, George Shear, 
and reconceptualized to be a contemporary art museum. And it draws um, resident artists and attention from around the world. So it became a point of interest to me in considering this dialogue in Jewish identity, memory, Jewish sites in historical and contemporary Greensboro through this art lens. And so, um, so that was his object, but then I was super excited about creating something there that was a part of the Greensboro Contemporary Jewish Museum and I fell in love with the kitchen and I had always really wanted to um, bring Shabbat into a contemporary art setting. And so it became a site for hosting um, a Shabbat event and was really an experiment in, in time-based art and site specificity. And so um, I invited seven-year-old Hadar Kedem, our daughter, to be the resident baker. And she taught a Shabbat baking workshop on Friday morning in preparation for the Shabbat event that we would have. She's a, a master baker in her own right, and she taught this workshop for the public. And you see Marilyn Chandler there, who is the head of Jewish Federation in Greensboro participating, and um, another really dear volunteer, and some other folks. And then um, after that, we had Shabbat dinner prep in the kitchen space, and that was really um, led by Ann Parsons, who is the head of the public history department at UNCG, and she just completely got on board and got this whole thing happening so that we could actualize having Shabbat in the museum. So people who were coming on Friday night came early and cooked together, baked together, then cooked together, and we had an, an open to the public Shabbat meal for 40 people that was a potluck. Um, in this space and this is the this is the space set up for the shabbat meal um, there's no documentation of it because it was realized in a more observant shabbat practice that's aligned with my family's practice and so i was really leaning on um, contemporary artist tino segal's work where he uh, basically writes instructions but doesn't document any of his of his work and so this is the only photograph that we have of that, but trust me, it was filled with beautiful food and people and was an amazing Shabbat gathering. We then, after Shabbat, had a poetry reading with Jessica and Richard who had curated the, the bookstore and two other writers that they invited, Lori Horowitz and Jacob Paul, and they all read from their work. After we did Havdalah in the gallery, and then the next morning, we um, had a writing workshop with, again, with Jessica and Richard and had this moment of being in this writing workshop in this amazing gallery space in this contemporary Jewish museum in Greensboro, North Carolina, with these fabulous authors who were really deeply wrestling with Jewish texts and ideas. And I was like, where am I? Like, I did not, I, it was just a sort of unknowing of space. Like, where, where am I? I? Could have been in Jerusalem or Brooklyn or LA or somewhere. And it was so amazing to really feel that we had really brought this, um, this together into this space. Just a few quick outcomes that have been really fun is that um, the Greensboro Contemporary Jewish Museum is listed in the National Museum of American Jewish History in their as their partners, they reached out to me and asked if they could add. There's a lot to say about, about that. Um, and um, the artist, uh, Zach Whitworth, um, sort of started this radical Seder that had, that had originally been written by George Shear at Elsewhere. And he was really inspired after we had done the Shabbat work or the Shabbat programming in um, Elsewhere. He was a resident there and was really inspired to to rework that Seder and to create a, a Seder, which ended up being online. And so this is Zach in the digital platform. And lastly, um, this is a piece from our four-year-old who participated in the project. His name is Rhodes. And I was contacted by the, by the Museum of Southern Jewish Experience recently. And I negotiated an acquisition um, by the museum of this object. So it is now gonna be on permanent display at that museum and Rhodes will receive compensation for that work, which I'm super excited about. Um, and just to end with the words of Adrian Murray Brown, I'm living a life I don't regret, a life that will resonate with my ancestors and with as many 
sorry, with as many generations forward as I can imagine. I'm attending to the crisis of my time with my best self. I am of communities that are doing our collective best to honor our ancestors and all humans to come. And this is where I'm continually striving to, to rest in my work and in my life. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and I just want to thank you. Thank you all for being here. And again, sorry, let's um, just again invite you to visit the Jewish Art Salon and Jada um, and to learn more about their wonderful work. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shoshana. This is very interesting, very informative, and can't wait to view the video when it comes out. By the way, it will be posted on YouTube in about a month, month and a half, <clears throat> sorry. And uh, the link will go out in our newsletter and on social media. So we're opening it up now to questions. Let me see if anybody raised their hand so far. Um, Elliot Ginsburg, you had your hand up already a while ago so yeah yes unmute yourself uh good am i unmuted now yes good excellent so that was awesome i just want to say yes or koach that that very 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 wonderful shoshana and um let me see if i can i one the question i'm going to go all the way back to or to the uh to the uh uh scribal and parchment uh practice uh, the ethical parchment practice and um, so I, my, my question has to do with intention and um, the whole process uh, that are you involved with, uh, are you establishing a relationship intentionally with, uh, with someone who grows the animal? Is there any, uh, although you don't have to uh, slaughter it uh, in, in, in a, some kind of sacred fashion, do you think about either uh, a shochet or, or halal, or is that just, um, and um, then more specifically in the act of writing, I know how much intention you brought to the creation of talitot. And being a sofer, uh, you, you always have, bring a certain kind of intention and ritual practices, whether it's mikveh or, um, and I'm just wondering, can you say more about intentionality uh, in, this, uh, in, in this process? In the in the or Hadash process. In the or Hadash process. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a great question. I mean, one of the things, um, one of in the beginning, it was very very exciting for me being in Jerusalem or being living on the moshav where we were living. We happened to be five minutes away from the parchment making facility of the family that we were working with. So, I was spending a lot of a lot of time there. Um, it was really, really, really important for me, one, to understand the process, but also to understand who these people are. But then, um, you know, as everything <laughs> unfolded and I really started to understand the process, the shift was to the shochets that we were working with to get our food, for our meat from. So I started working with him um, and that it was really important for me to understand the relationship that the people, the owners of those animals had with those animals, uh, understanding how he worked with them, what his shkitot looked like in terms of his traveling throughout Israel and doing that or working with Arab neighbors. Um, but what I found is that the parchment makers, and to no fault of you know their own, like they're not invested at all in what I'm doing. They're doing me a favor. They, they, we have a beautiful relationship um, and it's an unusual relationship and it's developed over, it unfolded over, I don't know, 10, 12 years. Um, but basically, you know, one of the things that, that, that one of them said to me is, the animals are never alive. How can they suffer? You know, that meaning the fetal calves are never alive. So I get that. It's not, it's not where their priorities lie. Um, and so when we made the shift here and I was still working with them, I realized I, I actually really, really want to figure out how to do that here. Who are the people that I can be in relationship with here that are doing that? Um, you know, questions of intentionality in terms of like how, you know, the, the different sort of Jewish frameworks that that happens and haven't sort of been resolved for me because I'm not hands on in, in that space. I'm not making the parchment. 
Um, I'm not interested in being the one to make all the parchment. I'm interested in orchestrating this. Although I would love to learn to make it, I know well that it's not, <laughs> it's not my thing. But there will be specific people put in place who will mark, who have to mark that process because there are certain intentions that need to be stated as the process gets underway. And in the scry and then when you get the parchment, right? As a sofera, then I yeah, mean, that's part of it too. But you're you're following it all along with this kind of intention. And yeah. That. So and and the 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 um, people that I've chosen to work with who are who are raising the animals, there's a trail that can be followed. It's a, there's traceability, which is really what is lacking in the animal there is no traceability in the industrial animal complex and this offers traceability and so it brings back in a relationship um a human animal relationship human to human relationship it it, it sort of regenerates the whole the whole process to me to me and there's always areas of growth <laughs> okay our next question is by susan schwaltz hi susan Wait, I'm just going to get, oh, did you unmute me? Yes, I did. Oh, thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to see you in the flesh yeah. after working with the women of the book project with you for so many years. Yeah, you too. I, I was fascinated by this museum project because I'm on your list. I did see some announcements of it and, and I didn't understand it until yeah. I, I've seen you explain it. And so what I didn't catch, maybe I, I missed it as we went along. One, it, does this museum still exist? And right. where is it exactly? And right. like you talked about a bookstore and then there was an exhibit space. I mean, I mean, it's not anything I would think to do, but I'm sorry I couldn't participate. <laughs> yeah, it, um, this, is, this is the question. It's like, I, I push, um, the community, the Greensboro community, to imagine that the museum continues to exist, right? And that maybe in six months or six years or 10 years, there'll be another exhibition. I that just it. because the gallery exhibit, which was the first, I, I like to say that it was the first exhibition. Um, not everyone agrees with me on that, but that's really the position that I'm taking with it. So in physical space, it exists now in all the homes of all the people who have those objects. Um, together, everything was collected for three weeks in a gallery called the Greensboro Project Space that we basically okay. named as the Contemporary Jewish Museum, as did the bookstore and all of these things. So it exists, it, there's access to it online and through the catalog and through listening to the, the new um, oral interviews and whatnot. Will there be another exhibition? I hope so, but I, I don't know. It's really, I, I, I um, it, it's up to the, the community can make those decisions. And I hope that, you know, maybe they will consider doing something. Well, I hope you really are another, together. another version of this project somewhere else, because it, it's, it's a fascinating idea to my perspective. Yeah, thank you. I would, I, my great, greater vision is to be able, is exactly that, to, to bring this model to different, especially Southern Jewish communities, but not only, um, and, and to, to work in this way, um, but specific to those communities, but similar, a similar model. Great. Um, the next question is from Rena. Hi, hi. It's Rena Bannett from Jerusalem. Hi, Shoshana. It's lovely to see you and to hear your projects. I really enjoy the questions you ask and how you find um, both answers, solutions, and new questions. It's really interesting. Um, I have a question about your middle project um, and also a comment about the final one. Um, in your middle project, when you were talking about the um, the uh, citizenship cards and the images that they brought, I wondered whether in addition to the um, questions or ideas that you were asking of those kids in the schools, whether you asked them also to make art 
around what they would like to see in the images? Or did you only decide to do the image searching among that adult group that we saw in your living room? And if you did, whether you have results to show. Yeah. So those, um, so, you know, there's so much figuring out. There's so much like, mm -hmm. should it be drawings? Should the kids make the images? What, you know, and ultimately, I really, I, I really felt strongly that I wanted the images. I wanted, I, I really, um, as you can see in a lot of the work, there's this, what I would call a replacement model in all of these right. that, that I'm really interested in what happens when we just read, when we, not just, but when we reinsert a different narrative in there. And so it was important to me that it be photographs. Um, the kids generated those mock cards that you saw um, the mock-ups, those images were generated by the students. Um, so students have generated, adults have generated them. Um, it's just this, you know, it, we, we do the questions and then, and then the next participants are doing the image generation and, and it keeps going in that way. So I really love that idea that you're asking all of us, anyone who's watching and anyone who's in your projects to rethink what we know and what we see I think that's a very important way of being. And just one more comment about the Greenboro Museum is that it seems to me that a museum like that would work anywhere in Israel as well from the point of view of you're not looking at sacred objects but ob objects of meaning. And when we start looking at the objects that mean something to us in each of our homes and making them, giving them value then we can look at who we really are in our worlds. And I think that's just a beautiful thing to do. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Rina. <laughs> okay, we have six more people asking questions, but we don't have completely unlimited time. So I'm gonna ask everybody just ask one question and Shoshana, just give a brief answer. Okay. <laughs> okay the next one is Michael Kagan. Hi, Michael. <laughs> Michael, please unmute yourself. Um, I am, you. Thank you. That was wonderful, Shoshana. That was wonderful. Um, <laughs> you going through this process and look what you're doing now. Unbelievable. So my question is, um, going to the cloth, the leather, uh, the, the skins, uh, um, it's oh, horrific. It's really, it's, it's a horrific what you've shown us. I don't know quite what to do with it or how to place it. And um, I, my understanding of the use of uh, animal skins uh, goes back to pre-agricultural um, revolution times where we, um, as Israelites, were nomadic people. These were our tools, our materials, our sacredness came from the buffalo, from, from as nomadic peoples. Uh, um, but can we transition to a post um, um, a, a post industrial time and and go to other materials and and I sent you material about making leather from mushrooms um, can we is it possible to make that jump paradigm shift into a new era um uh, I, I, the question about material um, comes up a lot. As someone once said to me, I'll be interested in, um, well, you know, many, 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 many years ago, I'll be interested. It's, not, it's great that women want to scribe, but I'll be most interested when we start to write Torah scrolls on, not on animal skin. Um, I think we can transition in the same way that farming is transitioning back to regenerative farming. And this is the same approach that people who are, who are raising animals are taking. It's regenerate, raising animals in a high animal welfare way is regenerative farming. It's about the land, ultimately. Um, and so these are the people that I'm in dialogue with and learning a great deal about. Other materials, it's not the area that I'm exploring right now. I love, I love the, the, I love the animal human divine relationship that, that is inherent in this whole thing. It, I see the problems in it, but I also really honor um, the meaning that is embedded in it as well. Okay, thank you. We need to go to the next. Thank um, you. Hanna Zelik, please. Please unmute yourself. 
Hi, thank you. Um, I uh, just very quickly, first of all, wanted to thank you for the, um, the, the quotation, I'm living a life I don't regret. That is going to be my kavana, my intention when I sit down in my studio, I think. Okay. <laughs> um, very quickly, I don't know if this is a, actually a quick answer, but it's a quick question. Um, when you said the 36 plus two, is that yeah. happening with the Lamed Vav? 36 or double high or something? Yeah. Like and then what's the plus two? Yeah, double, it's double, it's double high. And two is the, is the, is the bet, which is the, the second letter of the alphabet, but also the beginning of creation. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. So meaningful and moving. I, I, this will stay with me for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jen Gewurz. Hi, Jen. Hi, this was so beautiful and I loved how everything was so amazingly thought out. So um, just quickly, um, it sounds like you have worked at a distance to a certain extent for a lot of your processes. I just was wondering if you could speak to how the, the current distance with COVID is affecting this uh, these pieces. Yeah. Um quite honestly like for me that um i've completely turned inward i haven't been i haven't been creating work the past three months i've just been reconciling with this new reality and i um have wrestled with my own self about that and come to a place of giving myself permission to not have to respond immediately um because i know that I, I remind myself that in my own work it, it takes time until i know what and how I want to say what I want to say. So, and I, I, I can imagine um, where that question is coming from in your, from your own work and our own process and yeah. Great, the next yeah. one is Jonathan. Hello, can you hear me well? I'm having uh, technical difficulties. Can you hear me well? Yeah. yeah. Okay, excellent. Shoshana, first of all, your your presentation was just phenomenal in so many different levels. Thank you. Now, my question is this, concerning the, the, the North Carolina uh, Jewish Museum that you founded, uh, we know that the Jewish presence in that state is just uh, incredibly old. Uh, there was, uh, I believe the first Jew in the North Carolinas uh, arrived in 1585. And by the 1700s, we had lots of Sephardic Jews, Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, people have, you know, the last name Rivera, Rabbi Abru was there, all of from the British islands uh, in Newport. Um, I know that the museum is contemporary. It does not deal specifically with history. But was there uh, any element uh, that spoke about uh, Jews making up that place, being contributors to the history of that place, not just as contemporary residents, but actually people who fought wars there and got involved and, and, and helped build uh, the, the place. Did you get involved with that? Yeah, it's a good question. And no, I did not. That was not the positionality that I had in, the, in, mm -hmm. in this um, project. And while it's important, it, it, it didn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't an element that was integral to this to this project. Okay, okay. It it, it 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 does help make it uh, uh, more colorful uh, since uh, you know the Sephardic history is not quite common here in the U.S. Uh, this is something that uh, I don't know if you're going to keep that in mind for uh, as you travel around to do this incredible project in other areas. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I will. <laughs> Okay, we have two more um, people asking questions. First one, Richard McBee. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm so, sure. you know, this creation of this uh, Greensboro uh, Jewish, Contemporary Jewish Museum, uh, it's fascinating. It's, um, it's obviously needed. Now, you mentioned um, Edward Rothstein. Uh, you're probably aware uh, I was part of an exchange with him in Mosaic Magazine and, and Menachem Wecker about the Jewish Museum in New York and that whole thing. Uh -huh. um, what is becoming more and more clear, you know, we're all living through uh, this, this terrible crisis of COVID-19, uh, and we're suddenly forced online so much more than our, most of our normal lives anyway. But the idea of having virtual museums 
and the idea of having them as as not being substitutes for, but actually, in a way, replacements for the rather now old-fashioned mortar and brick museum is something that I think all of us in, in the Jewish art community need to consider very, very seriously. Um, you know, um, Yonatas had presented a virtual show in a virtual gallery mm -hmm. of his work and his, his, his partner's work. And it suddenly showed you how you can literally walk through a gallery in a virtual space and actually start to understand the works. So um, websites only get you so far. There's actually, think about websites, they end up be rather static, whereas virtual galleries can open it up. And you know, you start to think, well, it's so much impo more, so important to be in front of a work of art, the physicality of it. Well, just as a total aside, last night, I watched Some Like It Hot on a TV screen. I wasn't in a theater. I'm here in my home in a TV screen. And that movie blew me away. It's one of the funniest movies that American Hollywood has made. And there it is. It's virtual. But wow, what a work of art. What complexity. What, a, what, what tactility that you have, even though it's just on the screen. So I think we as artists, need to rethink what we are doing because I think a lot of our problems is many of the people perhaps on this on the Zoom have, don't have their works in museums and they want to have their works out there in a the public. And they're, I think, I think this, this COVID crisis is opening up the door for us and showing that we can have an expanded communication uh, beyond the, the, the old fashioned ways. Just a thought. Yeah, I mean, just to respond briefly, I um, agree about the importance of the virtual presence and there is a full website that, that is static um, for the most part of the museum. And I personally, um, for me, because my work is all about relationships, um, for me, the in-person and the amazing relationships that I built with people in Greensboro, I wouldn't trade that at all for the virtual reality. So, of course. Yeah. Okay, great. The last question is by Zach Whitworth. Hi, Zach. Hey, Shoshana. Um, I had a question about the Shabbat dinner that you held elsewhere. Um, my understanding in social practice is that documentation is super important. So in not having much documentation or any at all for the Shabbat dinner, do you think that makes a certain statement about social practice art? You're muted. Let me see if I can unmute her when she. <laughs> hmm. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, um, from the beginning, um, I think it is a statement about Shabbat, not not about social practice. There are so many different avenues, so many different ways to achieve um, the things that we want to do and say and put into the world through social practice, but Shabbat is Shabbat. And for me, um, it was important to bring, like I said, you know, everyone does Shabbat differently, but my family's personal practice was um, to have a Shabbat that is in a more traditional context of observance. Great. On that note, I want to thank everybody for attending and Shoshana for a really fascinating presentation. And also, uh, you broke the record of attendees, so we went out with a bang. <laughs> the series will continue in the fall. We'll do it once every two or three weeks, not every week. Uh, if anybody's interested in those, uh, please subscribe to our email list on our website, jewishartsalon.org. And um, I'm going to leave the line open for a couple of more minutes if people still want to ask questions or talk to Shoshana. Um, can I, I am Shoshana. Can I ask a question? I think, Shoshana, you used very quickly an expression, the middle race. Yeah. And I had never heard that. Can you explain that, please? Yeah, um, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm a little embarrassed, I'm forgetting the name of the author who first, the writer who first introduced me to that, but I think it's really sort of understanding that as 
this is a larger conversation, but in really looking at um, anti-Semitism and um, Jews as we are often considered white when it's convenient and Jewish and oppressed when it's convenient. And so there's sort of this notion that um, some people talk about as middle race. <laughs> Okay, I think that's pretty much it. So thank you again, everybody. Have a great Sunday. And we look forward to hearing from more, more about you, Shoshana, for, about future projects. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Yona. And I'm happy to stay on and talk to folks if you want to stay, but Yona, you okay. should go best. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thank, thing. You. thank you, Yona. The thing is, I'm I, gonna... need my I need my computer for an other online project, so I don't oh, okay. know if you lose the connection. So I can try oh, you... now to go to my other program and maybe you all stay on and you can talk as much as you like. So I can actually edit to get disconnected so that can happen. Okay. Sorry, there's a there's a setting that says that the guests can be there even if you're not. But I think I have that but you I can just know. you can just switch your host to Shoshana. There you go. Thank you. That's what I'll do. Okay. <laughs> so um, for being so flexible. <laughs> I, I want to tell a, a kind of funny but true story related to citizenship. Can people hear me? Am I yeah. unmuted? Okay. Yeah. So this is actually a true story. Um, I don't know if it was true in the 1950s. It's true now that if people have been living in the United States a certain amount of time and they're older, that they only have to ask answer very limited questions. So my father was an attorney and in the 1950s, this older woman came to him and she said, I only have one thing that I want, which is to become a citizen before I die. Will you go with me to see the judge? So my father goes in, she doesn't speak any English. And my father says, be really easy on her. You know, this is all she wants. So she says, okay, one question, who's the president? So my father translates that into Yiddish, and she answers, I can't do a good Yiddish accent, Eisenbauer, you know. So my father, she answers Eisenbauer very forcefully. And the judge thinks for a minute and says, you somebody's smiling like you know where this is going. What's his first name? My father translates it into Yiddish. She thinks for a minute and she goes, Shmuel? And the <laughs> judge says, <laughs> my father, what does Shmuel mean? And my father says, Dwight. Dwight. <laughs> <laughs> that is a true story. It is in the court records that Dwight's Yiddish name is <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so. That is so great. I want to add that I forgot to say that you actually only have to answer, there's 10 random questions that are asked when you take the exam. So yeah. I, that was a really important fact that I realized now I left out of that. Yep. Yeah. Shoshana, no. Shoshana, Shoshana, hi. It was a great talk. Can we get um, a copy of those questions that you gathered, the, your version of the citizen? Yeah, who, I don't, I can't see. Oh, who. it's Elizabeth, it's Elizabeth, hi. Oh, hi. Um, uh, yes, just write to me and ask. I, but they'll be I, in the, you'll, you'll get the Zoom. Okay, you, great. It'll be available, yeah. Uh, thanks so much again for everything, thank yeah, you. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Meryl. It's good to see you here. <laughs> Hi, Shoshana. Hi, Shoshana. Hi, Hi Yael. It's Yael Zebra, <laughs> otherwise you. known as Debra Zebra. Yeah. <laughs> I hope, I, I really wanted to thank you here from Jerusalem for, for your insight, for your wisdom. It's uh, really interesting to think about your work you know, knowing you first in, in, in America and now me being back here in Yerushalayim, it's just, it's interesting to think about ideas that we've spoken about, you know, when our, our, our positions are reversed. And it's, um, I'm really, really appreciating, you know, what you're doing from afar. I think that it's, uh, I, I love the idea. I remember when you first told me about your program about social activism and, and, and art and the combination of it and um, I really I think it would be really an interesting thing to do to really hi Hadar <laughs> hi <laughs> hi Gabrielle <laughs> hi 
my I'm, birthday partner right I'm, there. I'm going to sign off soon, but I, you know, yeah. I, um, no, but I'm just, the idea of, of, of actually connecting the idea of what is art in a, in a, in a framework of, of social justice. I think that's really an important question beyond the, the differentiation between art and craft. That, yeah. that came up in the discussion about the parchment. So that was really the sort of academic point that I wanted to bring up. But other than that, it's just wonderful to see you and, and dash to Andrew as well. Hi, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.